Welcome to No Budget Films. For now, we will do something completely new and exciting, and here we will go over the entire 1100 year history of the Byzantine Empire in only one video. Now the Byzantine Empire, Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Basileia ton Romaion, Empire of Romania, and so many other more names needs no introduction. But to those who have no damn idea on what it is, then all I can say is that it was the Roman Empire itself continued throughout the Middle Ages, based in the city of Constantinople. But honestly, this video itself is for those who are already familiar with Byzantium and its history. But if you're not, then good. Perhaps you will learn something from this. Please keep in mind that this video does not accurately tell Byzantium's history. Instead, it is more or less a rather biased retelling of its very colorful history. But enough with the introduction, let's just get straight to the story. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and if you can, please support us on Patreon by clicking on the first link below. The year is 330 AD. The Roman Empire, stretching from Britain to Egypt, Portugal to Syria, has stabilized again. The chaotic crisis of the 3rd century and the civil wars of the Tetrarchy have passed. The empire again has one emperor, being Constantine the Great. And in this year, he founded the Roman Empire's new capital, rebuilding the ancient city of Byzantium between Europe and Asia, along the Bosporus Strait. Now before 330, the city of Byzantium had a rather rich history beginning as an ancient Greek colony in the 7th century BC. But Byzantium's history before 330 shall be a totally different topic altogether, which I will skip for now. Anyway, there were so many damn reasons to why Emperor Constantine chose this location out of thousands of other places around the entire Roman Empire itself. But basically, he chose this because he knew it was very strategic, especially in terms of geography. And you shall see for yourselves later on why this city was at such a perfect location strategically. This new capital was basically called Nova Roma, or New Rome. But its people chose to call it after its founder, calling it Constantine City, or Constantinople. Though Constantine did not have much longer to live, and in 337, just seven years after founding the empire's new capital, he died. And following his death, the empire itself was split among his three sons, with the eldest Constantine II taking the empire's western provinces, the middle one Constantius II taking the eastern provinces ruling from the new capital Constantinople, and Constance I ruling the largest amount of territory in the middle, despite being the youngest. Out of the three brothers, the middle one being Constantius II, he was the smartest and most capable, and he too survived both his brothers so that by 350, he was the sole emperor of the whole empire, although only ruling it alone three years later in 353, after defeating other challengers. Constantius II, however, could not manage an empire this large altogether, as he was busy fighting a brutal war against Rome's traditional eastern enemy, the Sassanid Persian Empire. Thus, Constantius had to assign his younger cousin Julian to take care of the west, which was troubled by frequent barbarian invasions from across the Rhine and Danube frontiers. The young Julian proved to be successful at repelling Germanic barbarian enemies in the west, that by 360, his own troops proclaimed him the senior emperor against the ruling senior emperor Constantius II. But before both could war with each other, Constantius II died in 361, naming Julian his successor. Now, ever since Constantine the Great's time, Christianity became the dominant, though not official, religion of the empire. But with the new emperor Julian, things would turn around. Well, at least he thought it would. As a sole emperor, Julian was a competent administrator and skilled general but was just too over-idealistic and stuck in the past, believing that the old pagan faith could be restored, despite Christianity already becoming dominant among his empire's population, believing too he could rule like the Roman emperors of old in their glory days, when those days were long gone, and believing too that he could just simply march into Sassanid territory and destroy them all that way. Well, when Julian marched with his army into Sassanid territory in 363, he was proven wrong, as out of the blue, he was hit by a spear thrown by a Sassanid soldier, shortly after causing his death and the end of Constantine's line. And without an emperor, the army had no choice but to sign a humiliating truce with the Sassanid ruler Shapur II and elect one of their officers named Jovian as their new emperor, just to fill in the power vacuum. The new emperor Jovian, however, did not last a year, as in early 364, he was found dead in his camp before even making it back to Constantinople. Thus, the army again chose to elect another officer, this time being a strong Valentinian. Although Valentinian chose not to rule the empire alone, Instead, he decided to move west to rule the western provinces, appointing his younger brother Valens as his co-emperor to rule the eastern provinces from Constantinople. The brothers Valentinian and Valens were true enough successful in ruling their own halves, especially when it came to battling and invading barbarians. But in 375, after a failed negotiation with the Germanic Quadi tribe, Valentinian, due to a fit of his anger, suffered a stroke and died. 
and little did he know that the worst was yet to come. In 376, just a year after Valentinian's death, a massive migration of Goths fleeing the expanding Huns from the east occurred, storming into the eastern half's Danube border. And though the Romans believed this migration could be controlled, they were proven wrong as hundreds of thousands of Goths stormed into eastern Roman territory, and Valens, being not as strong as his late older brother, lacked the ability to control it. In 378, the Eastern Roman forces joined by Western Roman forces confronted the Goths at the Battle of Adrianople, resulting in a catastrophic defeat for the Romans, wherein Valens himself was killed. The victorious Goths were now free to pillage their way through the Empire, until a new emperor came to the Eastern throne in Constantinople, being Theodosius I, who you could say put these Goths under control, although not by driving them away or exterminating them, rather he allowed them to settle in the Empire as allied soldiers or foderati. Other than this, Theodosius I made a number of accomplishments including making Nicene Christianity the empire's official state religion and winning two civil wars, first against his former friend turned enemy, the general Magnus Maximus in 388, and second against the usurping emperor Eugenius, backed by Theodosius' loyal general turned traitor Arbogast in 394. But basically it was through his new barbarian Foderati allies, including Goths, that led to Theodosius scoring these said victories, thus leading to the rise of barbarians and their influence over the Roman army. Just a few months after winning the Civil War of 394, Theodosius himself fell ill and died in Milan in 395, permanently dividing the Roman Empire itself among his two weak and inexperienced sons, Arcadius taking the east ruling from Constantinople, and Donorius taking the west ruling from Milan and later from Ravenna. And here ends the story of a united Roman Empire. From now on, beginning 395, we will tell the Roman Empire story through the story of the Eastern Empire based in Constantinople, which from here on would happen to be the stronger and more stable half, as the western half in less than 100 years would fall apart. What now made the western half much weaker compared to the east was very much geography, as the western half was far more exposed to barbarian invasions from central Europe, while the east had a stronger military presence and was richer in land and resources. However, the problem with both halves was that the role of the emperor no longer seemed to have any significance as beginning with the underage Arcadius and Honorius, Powerful generals, mostly being of barbarian descent, assumed the role as the empire's protector, thus over time diminishing the emperor's rule. The first sole eastern emperor, Arcadius, may have been a lazy and useless one, but at least the eastern empire remained strong and stable by the time of his sudden death in 408, while the west was severely devastated following the sack of Rome by the Federati ally commander turned rebel Alaric in 410. Arcadius' son and successor Theodosius II may have been a young child when coming into power, but it was in his reign that the east thrived, while the west declined and under him the massive Theodosian land walls of Constantinople named after him were constructed, and these said walls when built proved effective enough to halt the deadliest threat to the world in the 5th century being Attila the Hun, as no matter how powerful Attila and his army of Huns were, that they in fact terrified the barbarian tribes forcing them to flee into Roman territory. They still had no power to breach such strong walls. It was through Theodosius II's strategy of bribing off Attila with lots of gold that the Eastern Empire was spared considering that the east was much richer than the west, and being satisfied with the bribe money, but also failing to capture Constantinople. Attila instead turned west and invaded the western empire, but was for once defeated by a combined force of western Romans, Goths, and other barbarians that had recently settled in western Roman lands in 451. In the meantime, all while Attila was on his way to conquering the world, a number of barbarian tribes after invading the now weakened western Roman Empire settled in it and eventually built their own kingdoms, namely the Visigoths in Gaul and Spain, Suebi in western Spain, Burgundians in eastern Gaul, Franks in northern Gaul, and Alemanni in north Africa, while the empire's northernmost part Britain was abandoned, leaving it to be devastated by Saxon raiders and for a time disappear from history. By the 450s, the eastern Roman Empire's borders hardly changed, while in the west, Roman territory was only limited to Italy, Illyria, parts of Gaul, and very minimal land in Spain. Although in 450, the Eastern Emperor Theodosius II after falling off his horse died without any sons to succeed him. Thus the person to succeed him was the officer Martian after marrying the late Emperor's sister Pulcheria. The new Emperor Martian may have had humble origins, but in 452 he managed to weaken Attila and his seemingly undefeatable Hunnic Empire by sending an army to attack Attila's lands in Pannonia while Attila had attempted to invade Italy. Thus following this event and Attila's death in 453, the threat of the Huns, which was thought to end the civilized world, had at last perished. Although things may have seemed stable as usual for the East, the end of the Western Empire had begun as in 455, Rome was attacked again, this time by the new Vandal Kingdom in North Africa, now becoming a naval power in the Mediterranean. And following this, the Western Empire fell into a political and succession crisis with countless of puppet emperors, one after the other controlled by powerful barbarian generals. The Eastern Empire too may have suffered the same kind of fate as well, in falling into the hands of powerful barbarian generals. 
as true enough the three consecutive emperors Theodosius II, Martian, and since 457 Martian successor Leo I, were under the control and influence of the powerful barbarian descendant General Aspar. And although the new Emperor Leo I may have been a Thracian of humble origins, who was made Emperor by Aspar mainly because he was thought to be easily manipulated due to his old age, Aspar and the majority of the Eastern Empire's barbarian descended army were proven wrong, as Leo did not intend to be a puppet. Instead, he wanted to rule in his own right. Thus, in 471, he assassinated his puppet master Aspar. And to balance out the Germanic barbarian population in the army, he recruited a new group into the army. And these were the Asaurians, a non-Hellenized and non-Romanized warlike people from the mountains of Asia Minor, who Leo believed would be more loyal, yet tough soldiers. And following Leo's death in 474, the chieftain of the Asaurians, who became Leo's top general and son-in-law Zeno, succeeded as emperor. Although he lacked a great amount of public support due to his Asaurian origins, which made the Eastern Empire's mostly Greek-speaking people see him as an outsider, and even a barbarian. As emperor, Zeno too was highly unpopular not really because he was an Asaurian, but it was during his reign in 476, when the Western Roman Empire was finally wiped off the map. Although nothing really spectacular happened there, as by this point the Western Empire was basically just Italy, and in 476, the Western Empire based in Ravenna was ruled by the weak child Romulus Augustus, who simply surrendered his position to his barbarian general Odoacer when having no other choice. Thus from here on, the Western Roman Empire died and was replaced by Odoacer's Kingdom of Italy. Although refusing to rule as Roman Emperor, Odoacer chose to rule simply as King, answering to the Eastern Emperor Zeno, who from here on was the only Roman Emperor, and the East as the only Roman Empire, wherein from this point on we shall call it as Byzantium, or the Byzantine Empire. Zeno's reign may have been a bloody one, with one rebellion against him after another, and not to mention he lost the throne once between 475 and 476 to his rival general Basiliscus, and almost lost it a number of times following that. But in terms of diplomacy, Zeno was rather successful, as he managed to turn the hostile Ostrogoth king Theodoric the Amal away from his lands by asking him to be Odoacer's problem instead. Zeno at least died peacefully in 491, leaving the empire stronger than he had founded it, while over in Italy, in 493 Theodoric, after taking over Ravenna, and killing Odoacer himself established the Ostrogoth Kingdom of Italy. Back in Byzantium, following Zeno's death, his wife, the former Emperor Leo I's daughter Ariadne, chose to marry the finance minister Anastasius, who was now the new emperor. And compared to Zeno, he was received much better by the general public, for he was seen as more civilized. The reigns of both Zeno and Anastasius I would then pave the way for the Byzantine Empire's golden age, as it was through Zeno where political stability was achieved after years of military takeovers, civil wars, and barbarian invasions. And it was through Anastasius I where the empire grew rich due to his financial policies and reforms. Although conflict with the Sassanid Empire resumed at a much larger scale during Anastasius I's reign, his reign too welcomed the 6th century and the golden age. And by the time Anastasius died in 518, the empire grew very wealthy. However, Anastasius had no named successor. Instead, he was succeeded by the commander of his palace guard force named Justin, a Roman Illyrian, who despite being originally an illiterate peasant, proved to be a competent emperor. But really, the brains behind Justin was his nephew Flavius Petrus Sabatius, renamed Justinian after his uncle. And by the time Justin died in 527, the empire's wealth further grew due to Justin's lack of spending, allowing his nephew and successor to inherit a much stronger and wealthier Byzantine empire. Now I could go on forever discussing what happened in Justinian the Great's 37 year reign. And those who are already familiar with Byzantium may already know what happened. But for those who don't, believe me, there was just damn too much happening that I could do an entire video or more on it myself. But to just put it short, it was in Justinian's reign. And only then, when Byzantium was at its greatest territorial extent. And not to mention at its height of cultural superiority. As basically they were the only powerful empire in the world. Aside from of course the Sassanids in China far to the east. Now when it came to conquests, Justinian managed to do a lot of it. After securing peace with the Sassanid Empire in the east, which thus allowed him to send armies to invade the lands the Romans once held in the west, that were lost to barbarians not too long ago, that in 534 Justinian's army led by his brilliant general Flavius Belisarius, in one swift campaign conquered the entire Vandal Kingdom of North Africa, annexing it into the empire. What now followed this was Justinian's ultimate dream, which was to reconquer Italy and particularly Rome from the new Ostrogoth Kingdom and make it Roman again. And although the brilliant Belisarius led this campaign again, this campaign was hell a lot longer, with all the scheming, mistrust, the envy Justinian and his wife Empress Theodora had towards Belisarius and his success, that Belisarius had to be recalled and not to mention the devastating plague of 542 that killed thousands in the empire, including soldiers, 
that had not only delayed the Italy campaign, but eventually led to the Ostrogoths to return and undo the Byzantine conquests, while in the east, the Sassanid ruler and Justinian's archenemy Khosrow I broke the truce with Byzantium and resumed war along the eastern border. Belisarius though returned to campaigning in Italy, but retired before the campaign even finished, thus leaving the much older general Narses to finish off the Byzantine conquest of Italy by 553 after destroying the Ostrogoth kingdom and repelling a Frankish invasion. Following this, another short Byzantine campaign in 554 returned at least the southern coast of Spain back to Roman rule basically to prevent the Visigoth kingdom there from invading Byzantine-held North Africa. And all this was nothing more but impressive as Justinian who masterminded all of these conquests, never even once left the capital. Of course Justinian has more of a legacy than conquests, as he is better known as the emperor who codified Roman law into something we still use today as a basis for our laws, as well as the construction of the Hagia Sophia and its massive dome that for almost a thousand years, it would be the world's largest church with the largest dome. Not to mention too, countless of other impressive artistic wonders, such as the mosaics of Ravenna, and Justinian too managed to build the silk industry in Byzantium by having monks smuggle the silk making secrets from distant China. The one fatal mistake though that Justinian made was not properly naming a successor, and though others blame Byzantium's eventual downfall on Justinian I's policy of overexpanding territory and spending all the empire's funds in it, I would really blame it on his lack of a succession plan, as following the death of his wife Theodora in 548, Justinian grew into a bitter old man without a succession plan. Thus at Justinian's death in 565, he was not succeeded by a competent general, but by his inexperienced although middle-aged nephew Justin II. And in his reign, it would go all downhill when the threat of the Sassanid ruler Khosrow I intensified, all while the Avars and Slavs began raiding the Byzantine Balkans, and the new Germanic people being the Lombards, led by their king Alboin, invaded Italy in which the Byzantines just recently recaptured from the Ostrogoths, all while it began becoming too expensive to maintain an empire this large. Unable to face the burden of running an empire, especially one that was now constantly being invaded on all sides, Justin II lost all his sanity, then in 574 he abdicated, passing the throne to his general Tiberius II, who he also adopted as his son. Tiberius II may have been a more successful emperor, but he did not rule long enough, as in 582 he died leaving the empire to his son-in-law Maurice another brilliant general. The new Emperor Maurice was now a successful military emperor. He managed to neutralize the invading Avars and Slavs, despite doing it at the cost of some territory in the Balkans, though Maurice was also responsible for compiling a useful military strategy manual and had managed to secure peace once again with the Sassanids in 591 by supporting the young ruler Khosrow II on his claim to the throne as the Sassanid Empire at this time fell into civil war. What was Maurice's weakness however was his poor economic policy and inability to please his people especially the aristocrats. This what would lead to his downfall in 602 was when he ordered his soldiers to camp across the Danube over winter, which was ironically part of his strategy to battle against the Slavs when they were at their weakest. However, the soldiers rebelled due to lack of pay and marched to Constantinople, overthrowing and executing Maurice together with his family and replacing him with the lowborn centurion Phocas. And from here on, it is all downhill. The 7th century would now begin terribly for the Byzantines, as for one, the execution of Maurice and takeover of the incompetent usurper Phocas provoked Maurice's ally, the Sassanid ruler Khosrow II, to declare war on the Byzantines, and rather than putting his attention to stop the growing Sassanid threat in the east, Phocas instead focused on purging anyone who went against him to secure his legitimacy, to the point that everyone grew tired of his reign. The ones to go in open rebellion against Phocas' reign was the governor or exarch of North Africa Heraclius, and a son also named Heraclius in 608. And when many provinces chose to support them against Phocas, the son Heraclius set sail for Constantinople from Carthage to depose Phocas, and when arriving, Phocas was executed, leaving the son Heraclius to take over as emperor, while his father died shortly after in Carthage. As Heraclius came to power, the Sassanids had now gained the upper hand, invading the eastern provinces of Syria, Palestine, and eventually Egypt, as well as parts of Asia Minor, all while the Avars and their Slav allies invaded the Balkans and searched for land to settle in, most of Italy already having fallen to the Lombards, and all of Byzantine Spain lost, as a Visigoth kingdom took back these said territories. Heraclius was now in a tough spot due to all of this, but at the end, he refused to give up, and thus he did the bold move of invading the Sassanid Empire when they were at their height of power and territorial extent. In only 6 years beginning 622, Heraclius using smart battle tactics managed to weaken the Sassanid Empire, though also taking advantage of the fact that a large number of the Sassanid forces marched west to besiege Constantinople, which Heraclius used to strike deep into the Sassanid heartland in Mesopotamia. The Sassanids, having allied with the Avars and Slavs, though failed to capture Constantinople in 626, all while Heraclius in 627 
turn the tide of war to the side of the Byzantines after winning a major victory over the Sassanids at Nineveh. And by 628, the defeats the Sassanids faced led to their ruler Khosrow II overthrown, which in turn weakened the Sassanid Empire, forcing them to surrender to the Byzantines. Now the Byzantines may have won a major victory that once and for all ended all their wars with the Sassanids, with the lands the Sassanids conquered returned to Byzantium. This victory however was short-lived, as while the Byzantines and Sassanids fought a brutal war, a new and unlikely force was yet to emerge from the deserts of Arabia in the south. And this new force the Byzantines would have to face were the Arabs, now united under the faith of Islam, in the form of the Rashidun Caliphate. Despite winning against the Sassanids, the Byzantine army was weakened that another large-scale war would mean the end of Byzantium. And in 636, the Byzantines would for the first time face the full might of the Arab army at the Battle of Yarmouk resulting in a devastating defeat for the Byzantines. And following this, the Arabs took over what the Byzantines had just gained back from the Sassanids a few years ago, namely Syria and Palestine. Heraclius would then die in 641 a broken man, who lived to see the war with the Sassanids over, but lived long enough to see his achievements destroyed as the Arabs emerged. However, Byzantium would still manage to defend itself against the new Arab threat, despite losing a lot of territory while the Sassanid Empire following their defeat and tons of internal conflicts would by the 650s be fully conquered by the Arabs and wiped off the map. Following Heraclius' death, the Arab forces swiftly took over all of Byzantine Egypt, thus limiting the empire's abundant grain supply. And in the next few years, the Arabs following their conquest of the Byzantine Levant took over the fleet and now began not only invading Byzantium by land but by sea. And not to mention, the Arabs by 660 grew into a larger power with the rise of a new dynasty, the Umayyad Caliphate replacing the Rashidun Caliphate after a civil war. The new emperor, who was Heraclius' grandson Constant II, may have been a young boy when coming to power in 641, but he soon grew to be a tough ruler, willing to do anything to defend and save his empire from falling to the Arabs in the east and Slavs in the north. The empire may have lost a lot of territory during Constant II's reign, but to keep the empire alive, new reforms were put into motion, mainly the reorganization of the old provinces into smaller self-sufficient military-controlled ones known as Themes, wherein the first five of them began in Asia Minor, the empire's new heartland. Constance II, however, soon came to believe Constantinople was no longer a safe place, considering now that the Arabs had built a navy and could invade at any time. Thus Constance in 662 left the capital for good, traveling to Italy, where beginning 663, he chose to have Sicily as his base in an attempt to make it the empire's new capital and part of his intention as well to restore Italy to Byzantine rule. However, his plans never came into motion as in 668 in Sicily, Constance II was assassinated in his bath. The new emperor in Constantinople, being Constance's son, Constantine IV, may have been young as well, but like his father, he was determined to be another strong man ruling the empire at a difficult time. And true enough, the young emperor from 674 to 678 managed to defend Constantinople against its first Arab siege, wherein the Byzantine victory is mostly attributed to the invention of the new secret superweapon Greek fire. Though Constantine IV had won against the Umayyad Arabs, not too long after, a new enemy invaded Byzantine Thrace, and these were the Bulgars, from the steppes of Russia. And though assembling a large army to drive the Bulgars away, Constantine IV's efforts failed, and thus the Bulgars were there to stay, and the defeated Byzantines had to cede some of Thrace to them. Constantine IV did not have much longer to live, thus he died in 685, passing the throne to his son Justinian II, another young but tough and determined emperor, like all the others in his dynasty. And like his father, grandfather, and great-great-grandfather Heraclius, Justinian II was another badass, strongman emperor, except a bit too much of a madman. Believing he would be forever victorious against the Arabs, Justinian II was proven wrong when suffering a defeat to them in 692. And in 695, just 10 years after coming into power, Justinian II was basically just seen as another asshole, who then lost all support and was overthrown with his nose cut off. And what followed was a 22-year period of anarchy, wherein six emperors came one after the other, between 695 and 717. Well, at this time, the Byzantines lost all of North Africa to the Arabs. Part of these six usurping emperors happened to be the deposed Justinian II, who in 705 managed to return to power simply to just have revenge on everyone who wronged him before, only to be deposed again in 711, and this time executed, ending the Heraclean dynasty as a whole, and only after three emperors would things stabilize again. In 717, when it would seem that the end of the Byzantine Empire was inevitable, an unlikely hero saved the day. This here was Conan, originally a Syrian shepherd, who taking advantage of the 22 year anarchy, became a general, and 717 took the throne becoming Emperor Leo III, right in time to defend Constantinople for the second time against the Umayyad Arabs. All this political instability in the past 22 years 
had now weakened Byzantium, allowing the Arab Umayyad Caliphate to now rise to the point of surely capturing Constantinople, that when they arrived before the city's walls in 717, they had such a massive army with them that the odds for a successful Byzantine defense were very low, but at the end, a combination of a harsh winter the Arabs had never seen, the use of Greek fire again, and the intervention of the Bulgars up north, seeing the Arabs as a common enemy saved Byzantium once again, forcing the Arabs to flee in defeat, never besieging Constantinople again. Following this victory, Leo III put an end to the anarchy by deciding to establish his own dynasty, the Isaurian dynasty, following the birth of his son Constantine in 718. However, Leo would soon grow overconfident of his victory, and further successes, believing he was right in all ways. Due to his Eastern and Islamic influence beliefs despite being an Orthodox Christian, Leo III believed this people's over-excessive veneration of icons was the reason why the Empire faced so many defeats, as God punished them for this, which then made Leo believe that if he put an end to what he saw as icon worship, then the Empire would rise up again. By 726, Leo III initiated a new movement known as Iconoclasm, or the breaking of icons which in 730 became a law. Thus, religious icons empire-wide were ordered to be destroyed, and that those who restored them or venerated them would face severe punishment. Though at the end, this entire policy led to mixed reactions of, as people from the eastern parts and especially soldiers strongly believed in it, but women and those from the western parts opposed it. And true enough, an entire part of the empire being the Venetian lagoon in Italy declared independence, establishing the Republic of Venice in opposition to Leo III's iconoclasm. And little did the emperor know that his policy of breaking icons began the schism between the pope and Constantinople, wherein both east and west would forever be divided spiritually, with the east becoming orthodox and the west becoming catholic. Leo III died in 741, believing his iconoclast policy would work and continue to work, thus his son and successor Constantine V took his father's iconoclasm to an even more extreme level that in his reign he ordered the deaths of basically anyone who would dare restore an icon as well as having monasteries looted as a way to fund the army as well. Though no matter how much of an evil monster Constantine V is portrayed as, especially in his extreme measures against icons and those who stood for them, he was at the same time an able ruler and experienced military commander that won many victories against the Arabs in the east and Bulgars in the north to the point of stabilizing the empire after decades of chaos. While Constantine V also made successful military reforms, including establishing a new imperial guard force known as the Tagmata, and the soldiers would soon enough be undyingly loyal to him and his cause, including iconoclasm, while people loved him for giving them away free food. Not to mention, it was during Constantine V's reign when the once undefeatable Umayyad Caliphate fell apart, being replaced by the new Arab power of the Abbasid Caliphate based in Baghdad while Byzantium too lost control of most of Italy when Ravenna fell to the Lombards in 751. Constantine V died in 775, leaving behind to his son Leo IV a far more stable empire that Leo IV would not have to face the same kind of problems his father and grandfather did. However, after only five years, Leo IV died in 780, leaving his wife, Irene of Athens, to be in charge of the empire as her son Constantine VI was way too young. In the meantime, as the Empress Irene ran the empire, the period of iconoclasm was put to an end at the 787 church council in Nicaea, while most of Greece was recaptured from the Slavs, though having a woman in charge was not very effective for the empire, as the Abbasids began invading the east and the Bulgar threat intensified in the north. Following a power struggle with his mother, Constantine VI tried to rule the empire all by himself but failed miserably when he led his army to defeat against the Bulgars in 792 which eventually led to his downfall as in 797, Constantine VI was overthrown and blinded by his mother Irene. Now Irene was the first woman to rule the Byzantine Empire alone, which was an achievement, but it did not mean she was a highly competent ruler, because the truth was that she screwed up the economy and failed to gain the loyalty of the aristocrats. The fatal blow for Irene came in 800, when the new threat came from the west, when the Frankish King Charlemagne was crowned as a Roman Emperor by the Pope, thus establishing the Frankish Empire believing the actual Roman throne in Constantinople was vacant, as a woman ran it. To settle the issue, Irene even negotiated to marry Charlemagne, considering that they were both widowed. But at the end, this only led to Irene being deposed and exiled by the aristocrats in 802, and who came after her was her finance advisor Nikephoros I, who although still supported the icons turned on Irene. And now in charge of Byzantium, Nikephoros reformed the economy that Irene mismanaged, went into conflict with Charlemagne, whose authority he refused to recognize, and most significantly declared war their northern neighbor Bulgaria when the Bulgars got a new ambitious ruler being Khan Krum, believing he could once and for all defeat the Bulgars in battle. Nikephoros went straight into a trap, was killed, and turned into Khan Krum's skull cup. 
Thus, what followed Nikephoros' death was another period of instability and civil war for Byzantium, Bulgarian invasions and devastations, and the return of iconoclasm in 815 under the Emperor Leo V, an Armenian general that usurped power in 813 while the empire fell into chaos. The Bulgarian threat, however, was short-lived, dying out in 814 with Krum's death, and although Leo V was assassinated in 820 by his friend turned traitor Michael the Amorian, iconoclasm was still back again, although much milder, this time only used for political purposes. The new Emperor Michael II now tried to hold together what was left of the empire, but in his reign, Byzantium lost Crete to exiled Muslims from Spain, while the Arab invasion of Byzantine Sicily began too. In 829, Michael II died, passing the throne to his son Theophilus, who in his reign began the Byzantine cultural renaissance founding universities and learning centers in Constantinople, being inspired by the court life of the Abbasid capital Baghdad. Though ironically Theophilus spent most of his reign at war with the invading Abbasid Arabs despite looking up to them culturally. The Abbasids though never managed to conquer Constantinople at the end, and in 842 Theophilus met an untimely death, being succeeded by his infant son Michael III, wherein in the following year 843, under the regency of his mother, Empress Theodora, was iconoclasm once and for all dealt with. To put it short, Michael III grew up to be a drunk and ineffective idiot, but at least he had the luck of having his empire run by competent people, such as his uncles, the generals Bardas and Petronas, who grew this new cultural renaissance and began turning the tide of war against the Arabs in battle to the offensive, and the patriarch Photius, who grew Byzantium's cultural influence by beginning missions to convert the Slavs and Bulgars up north to Orthodox Christianity through the missionaries Saint Cyril and Saint Methodius. It also happened in Michael III's reign, that the Abbasid Caliphate itself, as well as the Frankish Empire began to decentralize, while the Bulgarian state up north adopted Orthodox Christianity as its religion too. However, Michael III would meet his end in 867 as a result of putting too much trust in a friend who was actually a killer, and this was the illiterate yet smart, cunning, and ambitious peasant turned wrestler and horse tamer turned bodyguard Basil the Macedonian. Basil I now would establish the Empire's most remembered dynasty, the Macedonian Dynasty while also helping in kick-starting the new Byzantine Golden Age, which featured the Renaissance in art and culture that would make Byzantium the envy of the medieval world. But its new age was also defined by conquests, when Byzantium would now shift from fighting on the defensive to fighting on the offensive, now reconquering lands they have lost in the past three centuries to the Arabs in the east. Basil I ruled the successful 19 years until his death in 886, passing the throne to his son Leo VI, who may have possibly not been his but the previous emperor, Michael III's son. Quite a long story though, but as you will see, Leo's reign was a mix of success and defeat. As for all his knowledge in history, law, and strategies, he lacked some political skills and fell for the advice of his corrupt advisors. It was in Leo VI's reign when their northern neighbor, Bulgaria, became an empire itself under their ambitious ruler and its first Tsar Simeon the Great. And Leo, as usual, in listening to the advice of his corrupt advisors, provoked Simeon to declare war on Byzantium, which ended with Leo having to sign a humiliating peace with the Bulgarians that forced Byzantium to pay tribute to the Bulgarians. In addition, Leo VI's reign was troubled by naval attacks, led by rogue Arab pirates, the complete loss of Sicily to the Arabs, an attack on Constantinople by a new power being the Kievan Rus Empire from the north in 907, and a marriage crisis involving Leo himself having to marry four times in order to have a son, and only his fourth yet controversial marriage produced him the son he so wanted. Leo VI died in 912, while his son Constantine was too young. Thus, the throne went to Leo's younger brother Alexander, who basically only ruled to have revenge on Leo, the brother he held a grudge on his whole life. Thus, Alexander did more harm than good, especially when refusing to pay tribute to the Bulgarians, triggering Simeon to now resume war with the Byzantines after almost 20 years of peace. After only 13 months of ruling, Alexander died of a heart attack after a polo game leaving the empire in chaos, especially over the regency of the young ruler Constantine VII. All while Simeon's Bulgarian empire was gaining the upper hand, conquering Byzantine territory all the way down to Greece. The chaotic regency period although came to an end in 919, when the lowborn but ambitious admiral Romanos Lekapenos seized the throne and exiled Constantine's mother Empress Zoe, though not to oust the young ruler but to protect him, as Romanos did in fact keep Constantine in power, although choosing to sideline him as a puppet while Romanos I would from now on be the one actually running the empire. Now Romanos I may have been a successful ruler as he finally made peace with Simeon and the Bulgarian Empire shortly before Simeon's death in 927, made reforms that gave more power to small farmers, reconquered lands in eastern Asia Minor lost to the Arabs, wherein the entire Arab Emirate of Melitene itself was conquered by Byzantium in 934, and lastly led a successful defense of Constantinople from another invasion of the Kievan Rus fleet in 941 with the use of Greek fire. However, Romanus I did not have a happy ending, as in 944, 
He was overthrown and exiled by his sons, who in turn were just a month later overthrown by the rightful emperor, Constantine VII, now a grown man ready to rule the empire alone. As emperor, Constantine VII did in fact succeed in impressing foreign diplomats with the imperial palace and his mechanically operated throne, lions in a tree with golden birds that actually sang. But as an intellectual snob, who although impressively wrote useful sources on life in Byzantium in his time, as well as in understanding complicated Byzantine politics and the history of their neighbors, Constantine lacked the toughness of a soldier and the brains of a strategist. As seen in a failed expedition he organized to recapture Crete from the Arab pirates in 949. However, it was in Constantine VII's reign when some of Byzantium's most fearless badass generals rose to prominence, namely the brothers Nikephoros and Leophocus, and their nephew John Timiscus, who won battle after battle against the Arab armies in the east. Constantine VII too did not exactly have a happy ending, dying by possible poisoning or from a heart attack due to being overweight in 959. And though his son and successor Romanus II may have been well trained to run the empire, Romanus did not at all give a damn the moment he became emperor. Thus he decided to ignore everything his father taught him and screw it all up. However, he at least relied on these said generals. And it was in fact in Romanus II's reign in 961 when the same general Nikephoros Phocas managed to achieve the impossible in recapturing the entire island of Crete from the Arab pirates, while the armies in the east further weakened the once undefeatable Arabs. In 963, Romanus II himself suddenly died again due to alleged poisoning. Thus, the successful general Nikephoros Phocas assumed the role as the senior emperor by marrying the late Romanus' wife Theophano to fill in the power vacuum. Considering Romanus' sons were way too young, Nikephoros II Phocas as emperor was successful in the battlefield, again winning more victories against the Arabs in the east, and even managing to recapture Cyprus and Cilicia for the empire, fully neutralizing the 300-year-old Arab threat. However, his military campaigns in the west were not as successful while he too failed in being a politician as at heart he was really a soldier. Not to mention Nikephoros II again provoked Byzantium to go to war with Bulgaria wherein he solved the issue by having the same Kevinus attack Bulgaria and devastate it from the north only for the rest to invade Byzantine Thrace. In just a short amount of time Nikephoros II drastically lost his popularity and that even his closest generals including his nephew John Timiscus turned on him. And in one night in 969 John with his assassins killed the emperor Nikephoros in his sleep. Thus, John I immediately took over as the new emperor, wherein Romanus II and Theophano's sons still remained as junior co-emperors. John I now put all his attention to fixing the problems his predecessor Nikephoros II caused. And true enough, John had successfully pushed the Kievan Rus out of Bulgaria, conquered the Bulgarian Empire's eastern half, and again pushed the Arabs to the east, managing to annex Byzantine territory all the way south to Palestine. However, John's death was unexpected too in 976. Following John I's death, the legitimate emperor Basil II, son of Romanos II and Theophano, now assumed the role as a senior emperor. However, he was still perceived as a weakling palace-born ruler, especially by strong veteran generals like Bardas Scleros and later Bardas Phocas, all while the Bulgarian Empire that had not yet been fully conquered by Byzantium re-emerged with a new dynasty intending to get back at Byzantium. Basil II may have had a rough start, but after sealing an alliance with the Kievan Rus Empire, which converted the rest to Orthodox Christianity, Basil got what he needed being an army of over 6,000 elite Rus and Scandinavian warriors, forming a new army unit known as the Varangian Guard. And with their help, Basil managed to defeat the rebel Bardas Phocas in 989, while in 991, the other rebel Bardas Clarus, having no choice but to surrender or else face the might of Basil and his Varangians, renounced his rebellion before dying. Again with the help of the Varangians, Basil II later managed winning more victories against the Arabs in the east, and in 1014 he achieved his ultimate goal in winning a decisive victory over the Bulgarian Empire at the Battle of Clydion, followed by the blinding of thousands of Bulgarian prisoners of war. With the Byzantine conquest of the entire Bulgarian Empire in 1018 done, Byzantium itself was the dominant power of the medieval world, as by wiping Bulgaria off the map by conquering it. Neighboring powers, including that of the Serbian states and Croatia, chose to submit to Byzantium by paying tribute or suffer the same fate as Bulgaria, while other powers too, including the new Holy Roman Empire in Germany and the Kievan Rus, now both feared and were in awe of Byzantium's military and cultural superiority. Following his conquest of Bulgaria, Basil II expanded the empire further east into Armenia, mostly using diplomacy than warfare, and by Basil II's death in 1025, the Byzantine Empire ruled basically the entire Balkans extending east to Armenia, south to the deserts of Syria, and west to southern Italy. But again, it always happens that whenever an empire is at its peak of power, its decline is to follow. Now Basil II never married his entire life, and had no children at all. Therefore, he was succeeded by his younger and pretty much useless and excessive younger brother Constantine VIII, 
Polo died only three years later in 1028, and with no sons, he was succeeded by his son-in-law, the former mayor of Constantinople, Romanos III Argyros, who was forced to marry Constantine's old yet unmarried daughter Zoe, and due to their old age, Romanos and Zoe failed to produce children. It was in Romanos III's reign when Byzantium's slow decline would begin, as here all while things were doing fine for Byzantium, this rather idiotic emperor declared war on the Arabs of Syria, despite them being allies, and at the end it only resulted in a humiliating defeat for the Byzantines. And rather than learning his lesson, Romanos spent the rest of his money to build a church to glorify himself. Though this church would end up becoming his resting place, as not too long after he died in 1034, possibly assassinated in his bath, by the order of his wife Zoe and her new lover, the former money changer and merchant, Michael the Paphlagonian, who now became Emperor Michael IV after marrying Zoe. New Emperor Michael IV may have had more energy and vision to restore the imperial prestige Byzantium had under Basil II, that he in fact organized a massive expedition to recapture all of Sicily from the Arabs, which was at first successful until mistrust turned it into failure, and not too long after. The young Michael IV himself died of sickness in 1041. Following Michael IV was his nephew Michael V, who having no public support was easily overthrown in 1042, leaving the old Empress Zoe and her sister Theodora to run the empire, until Zoe married the senator Constantine Monomachus, who then became Emperor Constantine IX. And though he was a skilled administrator, he did not really care about running the empire, seeing their job as too stressful. It was in Constantine the IX's reign when Byzantium reached its greatest extent to the east, following the conquest of the Armenian city kingdom of Ani in 1045, which however made things only worse, as by expanding too far to the east, the Byzantines exposed themselves to a new rising enemy to replace the Arabs, which were the Seljuk Turks, while in Italy a new power emerged, being the Normans, who from adventurers in search of wealth and land, began forming their own state there through acts of piracy and terrorism. In 1050, the Empress Zoe died, while 1054 marked the year the Byzantines in the West would forever be split spiritually, as this was the year of the Great Schism, or the final separation between the Byzantine Orthodox and the Latin Catholic worlds, and from here, both East and West would never really trust each other again. Following Constantine IX's death in 1055, the Empire passed on to the hands of Zoe's younger sister Theodora, who died a year later, thus ending the Macedonian dynasty passing the throne to his secretary, the old and weak Michael VI, who in the next year was overthrown by the strongman general, Isaac I Komnenos, who intended to bring the empire back again to the glory days of Basil II. But in 1059, just two years after coming to power, he abdicated when nearing death. From 1059 to 1067, Byzantium was ruled by Constantine X Ducas, a former general who ruled making the worst decisions ever, especially in disbanding a large portion of the army in the east, right before the rising Seljuks under their ambitious ruler Alp Arslan made their first major attack on Byzantine territory, sacking the city of Ani the Byzantines had just conquered. Constantine X then died in 1067, and for almost a year the empire was under the regency of his wife, Empress Eudokia, until she married the strong general Romanos Diogenes in 1068. And as the new emperor, Romanus IV was intent to drive the Seljuks away once and for all. However, his hubris would be his downfall as in 1071, when deciding to face the Seljuks led by Alp Arslan in open battle, despite the Seljuks not wanting a fight, as they really just wanted to conquer some Byzantine territory to make their way south to Arab-held Egypt. Romanus and his large army was defeated at the Battle of Manzikert, where a traitor general abandoned him as well. Romanus IV was however treated well by his captor Alp Arslan, who even returned him back to the empire with gifts. However, Romanus was met with a shocking surprise back in the capital, as in his absence, the scheming court decided to depose him, and instead make Constantine the Tenth and Eudokus' son Michael the Seventh Ducas as emperor. And although Romanus attempted to take back the throne, his efforts failed and in 1072, the Ducas' loyalists blinded him shortly resulting in Romanus' death, all while at the same time, the Normans had captured Bari, the last Byzantine holding in Italy. Now the Byzantine defeat at Manzikert would have at least given a wake-up call for Byzantium to put aside their differences and expel this new Seljuk enemy. But instead, powerful Byzantine generals took advantage of the situation and put a claim on the throne, while the Seljuks taking advantage of the situation as well expanded deeper and deeper into the Byzantine heartland Asia Minor, thus putting an end to the centuries-old themes or military provinces there. And not to mention all this chaos was taking place when Byzantium's standard gold currency, the Solidus, was for the first time devalued. The incompetent Emperor Michael VII at the end was forced to abdicate in 1078, when the ambitious but very old general Nikephoros Botaniates took the throne. And although he had plans to save the empire, being almost 80 years old, he lacked energy. Thus his old age led to stronger and younger generals to have the opportunity to seize the throne. And just three years later, the very old Nikephoros III lost the throne to the young and energetic general Alexios Komnenos, nephew of the former emperor Isaac I, who vowed to save the empire before it was too late. Right at the moment when Byzantium could still be saved, 
Savior Emperor came in the form of Alexios I Comnenos, who started off his reign in 1081, facing off the Normans of Italy, led by their Duke Robert Giscard, that had just invaded the Byzantine Balkans in battle. And though Alexios lost the first battle, he managed to take care of the Norman threat in 1085 after sealing an alliance with the Republic of Venice. Following this, Alexios I in 1091 managed to as well take care of another enemy, being the nomadic Pechenegs in the north, after defeating them in battle with the help of the Cumans, the Pechenegs' mortal enemy. The biggest problem Alexios had to deal with now were the Seljuk Turks, who now basically took over almost all of Asia Minor, and lacking an army to push them back, Alexios I turned to Western military assistance, but in return he got the First Crusade, arriving in Byzantine lands beginning 1096. Although the First Crusade and its leaders were a headache for the Byzantines, they at least neutralized the Seljuks, and though they did not return lands in the Levant to the Byzantines, and instead created their own states there, they at least created a buffer between the Byzantines and the Seljuks, as well as with other Islamic powers of the area, thus allowing Byzantium to now turn the tide of war against the Seljuks to the offensive. Alexios I too would be remembered for issuing new reforms including that of the Pronoia, or Byzantium's own version of Western Europe's feudal system, replacing the old thematic system founded in the 7th century, introducing a new gold currency known as the Hyperperon, replacing the old Solidus, marrying off his relatives to other powerful families to create a sense of unity, and not to mention introducing a new style of imperial crown in the shape of a dome. Though more importantly, Alexios I brought some political stability back to the point that people no matter how powerful they were would not even dare challenge the emperor and his authority. Following Alexios I's death in 1118 was a period of stability and stable succession as he was succeeded by his son John II Komnenos, who like his father was also a brilliant military emperor and reformer who won a number of battles restoring the empire to its former glory, but he was more so the wise philosopher emperor, well loved by his people. John II was perhaps best remembered for restoring most of Asia Minor that had fallen to the Seljuks, back to Byzantine rule. Although again the biggest headache he had to deal with were the new crusader states known as Outremer, and though he attempted to invade the defiant crusader state of Antioch, John II failed to do so as he died in 1143 during the campaign, passing the empire to his youngest son Manuel I Comnenos, who since the very beginning of his reign possessed a lot of ambition, but his reign began out badly when the crusader state of Edessa had fallen to a new Islamic power in Syria, which thus led to Western Europe to launch a second crusade, again a nightmare for Manuel, who at the same time had to face a Norman invasion of Byzantine Greece which he managed to later repel, despite the Normans stealing Byzantium's silk-making secrets. In the rest of Manuel's reign, he scored some victories over the Hungarian Kingdom, Serbs, Seljuks of Asia Minor, the Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia, and the Crusader state of Antioch, thus further expanding Byzantine territory and growing its influence by making these said states Byzantine vassals at different points. However, Manuel still had a number of failures, such as his attempted reconquest of Italy from the Normans in the 1150s that went nowhere, a failed joint invasion of Egypt with the Crusaders, and most of all his dealings with the Republic of Venice, where Manuel's decision to cut ties with them in 1171 only led to Byzantium and Venice to be mortal enemies, while Manuel, admiring Western Europe too much, would also lead to cultural tensions in the empire. Manuel I's biggest flaw, though, was his overconfidence, and this was made clear in 1176, when he declared war on the Seljuks, only to be ambushed by them at the Battle of Myriokephalon which thus put an end to all Byzantine efforts to restore their rule to Asia Minor. And from here on, the Seljuks and primarily the Turks were there to stay. The saddened and defeated Manuel died in 1180, and rather than having a trained successor, he only had his young son Alexios II, who by default was under his mother Empress Maria of Antioch's regency, and due to his mother being a Western Latin by blood, who was not very popular among the proud Byzantine people, giving Manuel's cousin and biggest rival the conman and Andronikos Komnenos every opportunity to seize the throne for himself in 1182. Following a massacre of Constantinople's Latin inhabitants, the imprisonment and execution of Empress Maria, and the execution of Alexios II, Andronikos I fully seized the throne in 1183, and though he had good intentions especially in ridding the empire of corruption, his measures were too extreme, especially towards the nobility that he hated the most, that he soon turned into a totalitarian dictator that purged literally everyone that said the slightest thing against him. Meanwhile, the 1182 massacre of the Latins provoked the Normans in Sicily to launch their third invasion of Byzantine Greece in 1185, resulting in the sack of the Empire's second city Thessaloniki, which then caused Andronikos to lose his popularity that the same people that supported him as well, as well as the nobility, chose to back the young though inexperienced aristocrat Isaac Angelos, who after escaping an attempt to be arrested by Andronikos, was proclaimed emperor, and now Andronikos' most loyal supporters, now loyal to Isaac, lynched Andronikos to death for days. 
The new Emperor Isaac II Angelos now may have lacked experience and was thought to be basically a puppet by the rich and corrupt aristocrats to allow them to continue their corruption that Andronicus brutally cracked down on. However, Isaac was at least successful in expelling the invading Normans from Greece. But other than that, the rest of his reign would be disaster after disaster. Now, due to Isaac's incompetent leadership and heavy taxation in the Bulgarians to fund his own lavish wedding, the Bulgarian nobility declared Bulgaria once again independent from Byzantine rule after being peacefully under Byzantium for such a long time. Ever since Basil II's conquest of 1018, Isaac II, no matter how much of the crappy emperor he was viewed as, still knew he was responsible for causing the Bulgarians to rebel. Thus, he sent armies to take care of the Bulgarian threat, where he personally led some campaigns himself. Although all attempts to put the Bulgarians back under the empire failed, at the same time too, the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem fell to the new Islamic power of Saladin's Ayyubid Sultanate in 1187, which thus led to the Third Crusade, and this included Byzantium being used again as passing ground for the Crusader army. And here it was the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, that deeply troubled Isaac. Although Frederick still made it out of Byzantium, Isaac did not last long in power as in 1195, he was suddenly usurped, blinded, and imprisoned by his older brother Alexios III Angelos, right when Isaac once again attempted to restore imperial rule to Bulgaria once and for all this time. Now Alexios III, despite having no ambitions of his own, he was put in power as the nobility felt he was much easier to manipulate than his younger brother before him. And true enough, Alexios III was simply a good-for-nothing idiot that he did not care at all about his empire, allowing corruption to reign and territories in the Balkans to easily slip away to the Bulgarians and most of Asia Minor to slip back to the Seljuks. In the meantime, Isaac II's son, also named Alexios, managed to break out of prison as he too was imprisoned with his father and traveled to Western Europe to seek help from the Venetians to restore he and his father back to power. All while the Latin West had already assembled the Fourth Crusade in 1202 due to the idiot Alexios promising wealth he could not pay to the Fourth Crusade's army and military assistance he could not provide, the Venetians diverted the Fourth Crusade from Jerusalem to Constantinople and though Alexios III was ousted, leaving young Alexios to take the throne as Alexios IV with his father Isaac II released and put back in power as well despite being blind. The foolish Alexios IV could not pay what he promised, and before he could pay up the crusaders, he and his father were overthrown by a palace coup, wherein Alexios IV in early 1204 was executed and his father Isaac later dying of a heart attack after hearing of his son's death. The crusader army camped outside Constantinople all these months now could not wait any longer, and so they stormed Constantinople and brutally sacked it, and when meeting very little resistance from the Byzantines, Constantinople had fallen to the Fourth Crusade. What followed the Fourth Crusade's capture of Constantinople in 1204 was the division of lands once under the Byzantine Empire among the leaders of the Fourth Crusade, and as Constantinople fell to the rule of the new Latin Empire, the surviving Byzantines established their own successor states, namely the Despotate of Epirus in Western Greece and Empire of Trebizond in Northeast Asia Minor. Though the one to become the actual successor of the fallen Byzantium was the Empire of Nicaea in Western Asia Minor, founded by Theodore I Lascaris. Although it would take years for Nicaea to grow into a dominant power, the Latin Empire in Constantinople, however, never became anything, as in 1205, or just a year after they came to be, they suffered a heavy defeat to the new Bulgarian Empire at the Battle of Adrianople, which then reduced their territory, while the Empire of Nicaea, after defeating the Seljuks in 1211, soon expelled the Latin Crusaders from Asia Minor. In Greece, the rising despot of Epirus in 1224 captured Thessaloniki from the Latin Crusaders, but before Epirus could capture Constantinople from the Latins, their forces lost severely to the Bulgarians in 1230, with their ruler Theodore Komnenos Dukas even captured, making Bulgaria now under their Tsar Ivan Asin II, the dominant power of the region. As for Nicaea, they began growing in influence and territory under Emperor John III Vatatsis, the successor of Theodore I since 1222. And under John III, the Byzantines of Nicaea for the first time annexed territory in Europe. In 1235, both John III of Nicaea and Ivan Asin II of Bulgaria attempted to besiege Constantinople and capture it from the Latins. But at the end, both failed when the Latins, despite lacking men, managed to successfully defend Constantinople, causing Asin to turn on Vatatsis. The Second Bulgarian Empire's time of dominance, however, would not last as after Ivan Asin II's death in 1241. The Mongols have now reached Europe and devastated Bulgaria, among other lands, including Nicaea's eastern neighbor, the Seljuks. Though at least Nicaea would be the lucky one here, as with both Bulgaria and the Seljuks weakened, they now had the advantage to expand deeper into the Balkans, eventually surrounding the Latins to Constantinople and its surroundings. After a 32-year reign, John III Vatatsis died in 1254, leaving his son Theodore II Lascaris to inherit a much stronger empire of Nicaea, which further grew under him. However, Theodore II died in 1258, and following this, his longtime rival Michael Paleologus seized the throne of Nicaea, eliminated all threats to them, including Epirus and the other Latin states in 1259, by defeating their forces in battle. And in 1261, by surprise, Michael's forces managed to recapture Constantinople from the Latins in only one night. Thus, Michael was crowned as Emperor Michael VIII, restoring the Byzantine Empire and establishing the Paleologus dynasty. 
Though the Byzantine Empire was restored after 57 years of Constantinople under the Western Latins, Byzantium was now very much reduced, not only in size but in status, as they were no longer a dominant power of the medieval world, but now the Greek kingdom in the Balkans, and a regional power at the same level as their neighbors, the Second Bulgarian Empire and Serbian Kingdom. However, the new threat the restored Byzantium would have to face came from the West, and this was in the form of the French King of Sicily, Charles of Anjou, who vowed to invade the newly restored Byzantium and revive the fallen Latin Empire. However, Michael VIII struck first by funding a rebellion in Charles Sicily that did in fact prevent Charles from carrying out his ultimate dream. Though Michael VIII succeeded in neutralizing the imminent threat from the West, he focused on the West too much, leaving Byzantium's heartland Asia Minor undefended, that eventually the Turks of Asia Minor, following the dissolution of the once powerful Seljuk Empire, would slowly take over Byzantine territories as their own, in fear of the expanding Mongols in the East. And one such Turkish power or Beylik that had risen by the end of the 13th century in Asia Minor was that of the warlord Osman. Michael VIII too died in 1282, hated by his people despite being the one to recapture Constantinople from the Latins, as he attempted to submit to the Pope and the Catholic Church which created such opposition among his people, seeing him as a traitor. And now his son and successor Andronicus II began his reign cancelling his father's controversial church union, and finally focusing imperial attention to Asia Minor in order to defend against the expanding Turks. The Byzantines, however, failed to stop these said Turks, and most particularly that of Osman's army. Thus, in 1302, Andronicus II turned to hiring a band of untrustworthy Catalan mercenaries, and sure enough, they beat back the Turks, but were not receiving their pay and seeing their general slain by Byzantine forces. They turned on the Byzantines, going on a rampage, pillaging Thrace and Macedonia in the process, before conquering Athens in 1311. Andronicus II's failure to stop the Turks, his mismanagement of the empire's economy, and decision to hire the Catalans would eventually lead to his downfall, when the empire's angry young population, wanting a better future, backed as his own grandson Andronicus III as emperor. And from 1321 to 1328, Byzantium was plunged into a civil war between the grandfather and grandson Andronicus, resulting in the grandson victorious in 1328 and the grandfather overthrown. Now in power, Andronicus III vowed to one last time restore the greatness of the Byzantine Empire, at least in making it a regional Balkan power, and he was true enough mostly successful, especially in conquering the entire Thessalian Empress from the rebel Byzantine breakaway despotate of Epirus, founded after 1204. However, Andronicus III still failed to maintain Byzantine imperial presence in Asia Minor, that by 1337, basically all of Byzantine territory in Asia Minor had fallen to Osman's successors, now as the Ottoman Empire. Despite his efforts to restore what was left of his empire, Andronicus III unfortunately did not have long enough to fully achieve his dreams as death suddenly came to him in 1341. And what followed was a succession crisis, that turned into a civil war, even far worse than the one back in the 1320s. Here, Andronicus III's wife, Empress Anna of Savoy, and her faction packing her and Andronicus' young son John V, fought against Andronicus' closest friend and general John Cantacuzinus and his faction, over control of the empire, and at the end, neither side gained the upper hand. Rather, it were their foreign allies that did, as the Serbian kingdom now expanded and evolved into the Serbian Empire, with their king becoming its first Tsar, Stefan IV Dusan, in 1346 while the Ottomans from Asia Minor, led by their Sultan and Osman's son Orhan, for the first time gained lands in the Balkans after supporting Cantacuzinos, while the Italian republics of Venice and Genoa too gained islands in the Aegean as a result of helping different factions in the civil war. At the end of the day, John Cantacuzinos won civil war, becoming Emperor John VI, all while the Ottomans eventually began expanding deep into the Balkans once they gained their first holdings. But in 1354, John VI lost the throne when the rightful Emperor Andronicus III's son John V took it back, with the help of Italian pirates. The Empire John V came to rule now, however, had been slowly disintegrating now that the Ottomans began expanding to the point of surrounding Constantinople and cutting it off from the rest of the Empire. And without any choice, John V had to turn to asking for military assistance from the kingdoms of Europe that have now grown both militarily and culturally superior to Byzantium, when it was Byzantium that was this kind of power before. However, his efforts were in vain when both the King of Hungary and the Pope turned him down, with literally no more choice. John V in 1372 peacefully surrendered to the Ottoman Sultan Murad I as a vassal, meaning Byzantium was to now pay tribute to, provide the Ottomans with troops for their campaigns, and basically follow every damn thing the Sultan said or face extinction. With Byzantium now an Ottoman vassal, the Ottomans continued their conquest of the Balkans, later defeating the now weakened Serbian Empire at the Battle of Kosovo in 1389. The Emperor John V would then die of a highly possible suicide in 1391 due to the humiliation of having to be an Ottoman vassal and living an entire life of tragedy and humiliation. And now his son Manuel II Palaiologos came to inherit a severely reduced empire on the verge of extinction. The Ottomans on the other hand, not only defeated and made the Serbians their vassals, 
They too defeated and fully annexed what was left of the Second Bulgarian Empire by 1393, put Constantinople under siege in 1394 when Manuel II refused to pay tribute, and in 1396 defeated a massive crusade organized by the kingdoms of Europe at the Battle of Nicopolis. The sudden rise of the Ottomans and the fact that they literally defeated both Serbia and Bulgaria sent such shockwaves to the rest of Europe. However, Europe, especially England and France, had their own problems to deal with most notably the Hundred Years' War. However, another stroke of luck would save the Byzantines when the Ottoman army was defeated by the rising power of Timur's Turco-Mongol Empire at the Battle of Ankara in Asia Minor, while their Sultan Bayezid I was captured as well, whereas the Byzantine Emperor Manuel II was away, seeking help from both the kings of England and France. But now back in Byzantium, there was at least one last time for Byzantium to recover. The defeat at Ankara and capture of Bayezid I created the first succession crisis and civil war in the history of the Ottomans. Though the Ottomans soon enough got their act back together by 1413, when Bayezid's son Sultan Mehmed I came to power, there was Manuel's ally, creating peace between both empires. However, following Mehmed I's sudden death in 1421, Byzantium and the Ottomans would no longer be at peace with each other, as the new Ottoman Sultan Murad II had the ambition to conquer what was left of Byzantium itself. To avoid conflict and keep Byzantium alive, the old Manuel II again resumed paying tribute to the Ottomans, and not too long after he died in 1425, leaving the empire to his eldest son, John VIII Palaiologos, who continued paying tribute to the Ottomans as well, despite fearing the one day that the Ottomans would betray them. Thus, John VIII traveled to Italy to unite the Byzantine Church with the Latin Church, which at first succeeded but failed, when people back in Constantinople rioted, seeing their emperor again as a traitor. The Ottomans again began resuming their wars in the Balkans against Hungary and Wallachia, wherein the Ottomans were victorious first at the Battle of Varna in 1444, and later at the Second Battle of Kosovo in 1448. But back in Byzantium, as Constantinople's end was near, the one place that was thriving in education and culture despite the mess around was the Morea, or Peloponnese Peninsula in southern Greece. And here its governor, a despot, was Emperor John VIII's younger brother, Constantine Palaiologos, who following John's death in 1448, succeeded his older brother as the last Byzantine emperor, Constantine XI, moving to Constantinople and leaving his younger brothers, Demetrios and Thomas, in charge of the Morea. In 1451, the Ottoman Sultan Murad II died, while his son and successor Mehmed II had no other goal but to once and for all conquer Constantinople. In beginning 1452, Mehmed made preparations for the ultimate siege while Constantine XI sent letters to all the kingdoms of Europe asking for military aid but at the end did not get enough. Though at least he still succeeded in once again uniting with the Latin Church despite receiving strong popular opposition again. The ultimate showdown then came in 1453 when Constantine XI, with an army of just over 7,000 including Latin allies, faced off against Mehmed II's Ottoman army of over 80,000, defending the thousand-year-old walls of Constantinople very bravely for about two months. But at the end, this was the end of Byzantine Constantinople. And as the last emperor died fighting, Mehmed II rode in, making Constantinople the Ottoman Empire's new capital on May 29, 1453. However, the Byzantine story does not yet end, as Constantine's brothers Demetrios and Thomas continued to hold on to the Morea until Mehmed II conquered it in 1460. While in 1461, all claims to the Byzantine throne ended when Mehmed II captured the city of Trebizond, ending the breakaway Byzantine Empire of Trebizond that had been there since 1204. Although Byzantium here ended physically, it still lived on spiritually, as Mehmed II still decided to keep Constantinople's orthodox patriarch in his place, and so did he decide to make the rotting Constantinople a thriving metropolis once again, while Byzantine scholars escaping the Ottomans fled west to Italy, introducing the knowledge of the classical Greeks and Romans the Byzantines preserved all these centuries, thus leading to the birth of the Italian Renaissance. And now this is about it for the entire story of the Byzantine Empire from 330 to 1453, condensed into one video. Thank you for watching it, and again, don't forget to hit the bell button and subscribe to our channel, and support us on Patreon as well.